If we look at the genetic data, what we see is that some of the genetic variants associated with going further in school are also correlated with this higher likelihood of developing schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Thank you for joining me on this. That's very nice of you to come on. How are you doing? Oh, thank you for inviting me. I am, I'll be honest, I'm a little overwhelmed. This has been the first week that we've started to get some book publicity and these things are very unpredictable. Um, uh, and But the response has been uh, more than I was anticipating, which is a good thing, but um, a little bit overwhelming too. Well, it's quite a fascinating topic, isn't it? So I guess it's get, it's really getting people's attention. Would you be able to sort of summarize the book a little bit? Yes, I'm happy to. Um, so the book the book is really about luck and about a very particular type of luck, which is which genes you happen to inherit from your parents. So if you think about all the possible combinations of genes that you could have gotten from your parents, there's um, trillions of possible combinations and you got one of them. So what the book is interested in is how does that luck affect your life? Um, and not just what you look like, um, your chances of diseases, but also things like how far you go in school, how you do in the labor market, things that we usually study under the, the aegis of social inequality. Um, how do scientists go around studying that? Like, how do we know that these things make a difference for your life? Um, and then what do we do with that information in a way that avoids some of the um, the horrors really that have been, um, that have come out of, uh, the, the historical legacy of eugenics. Can we think about that information in a new way, um, that honors our political and moral commitments to equality? So, um, it's ambitious as you can imagine to try to put all of that in one book, but I think it's important. Yeah, it's, I think it is important. And there was something that, um, I think you wrote near the beginning about how, uh, with controversial topics such as this, if we don't all come together and, and look at them, the people who have that information will be the white supremacists in this case. Um, are, are people not, are scientists sort of shying away from discussing genes and eugenics? Um, I think there is very much a hesitancy amongst some fields of the social sciences. My field is clinical psychology by training. Um, I think psychiatric genetics or, or psychiatry and clinical psychology, um, they don't tend to shy away from talking about genetics in terms of things like autism spectrum disorders or schizophrenia, although there's still pockets of controversy there. Um, but when we're talking about education or um, income, uh, scientists who study those uh, topics do typically shy away from thinking about um, how genetics might influence their findings or how genetics could be integrated into their research designs. Um, and I think that that avoidance is well-intentioned. Um, but as you, as you just said, I think many people already know um, that genes matter for people's lives. And if we don't have a general conversation about how to make meaning out of that, then we're really seeding the conversation to some of the most extreme voices. You grew up in a religious family, I gather from the book. Um, and what can we learn from, you know, so-and-so begat? Begat is the most extraordinary word, isn't it? It's, the, it's only yeah, used biblically. it really is. Begat. <laughs> Someone begat somebody. What can we, what can we learn from that and, and, and how it fits in with genetics? And, and did that inspire your... Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I often say that I don't take the Bible literally. I'm not uh, religious anymore. I, I don't consider myself Christian anymore. Um, but I do take it seriously as a work of literature and try to think about what can we learn about um, traditions of, of that you know come through wisdom that comes through this story if taken seriously as a piece of literature. Um, and it's interesting to think about that question because so much of the Bible is genealogies, right? And it's it's really used to talk about identity like who really belongs, you know, who really um, is welcome into a, into a tradition. And I think that's interesting because so much of what's coming out of the field of population genetics and ancient genetics these days is 
how much our family trees are all the same, actually. Like we're all part of the same family tree. And so I think thinking about um, describing the results of genetics in a way that emphasizes our interconnectedness can be really powerful for people. Who is your family? We don't have to go back that far in human history to find a time where everyone alive then was the ancestor of everyone alive now, which is kind of wild, actually, when you, when you think about it. That's one of those things, you know, when you read a book and because I'm a lay person, so I'm sort of reading it and I am, it is very accessibly written, which is, which is. Oh, a, thank a you. Yeah, that's a talent in itself, being able to, uh, to, to write things in such a way that somebody who, like me can understand 95%, 96% of it. Um, but then the, the, the trouble is then taking this, and I have this with every book I read for the show, is then I want to tell everyone about these things and I explain it and they're like, yeah, but that's, and I'm going, oh no, I've got it wrong, haven't I? I think I've got it wrong. But it, it was something like, uh, and it blew my mind. So you can go back to a point and I think it was, so firstly, there was the point where one person is alive uh, who we can all trace our ancestry back to and that would be 2,000 years ago maybe. And then like 5,000 years ago, everyone alive then was we could trace our ancestry back to all of them is that have I said that right yes you have so I think there's kind of two things that make this hard to wrap your mind on and one is just how difficult a time we have as humans with exponential numbers right I mean we've seen this even with response to COVID as soon as we think about like it's doubling um you know our sense of how quickly numbers get really big our intuitions about that are just bad. But that's what happens when you're talking about your number of ancestors, your genealogical ancestors, right? So you have two parents, you have four grandparents, you have eight great grandparents. If you start doubling things, um, those numbers get astronomically large really, really quickly. And so when you're thinking about tracing the family tree of everyone in terms of their genealogies, you rapidly get to a point in which you have more ancestors then we're basically people alive then, right? It was everyone alive. And so I think it's, that's part of the key in understanding how it could be that, you know, we go back five or 6,000 years and everyone there was a genealogical ancestor of everyone alive now. Is it incest? Is it, is it, in, is it a sort of incest <laughs> going on? Well, I mean, in the sense that there's, uh, you know, people mate with other people who are d distantly related to them, right? And the smaller the population, the more likely that is to be true. So the example that I give in the book is that um, my aunt and uncle are actually fourth cousins. So, you know, if you start going back and tracing all of our genealogical ancestors, there's a couple of people who pop up in that family tree more than once because they were the great, great grandparent of more than one of my um my ancestors. Um, I think the other thing that is kind of unintuitive about it is, um, you know, you only get part of your parents' genes. And so most of your genealogical ancestors, most of the people who are in your family tree, they didn't leave any mark on your genome. So they're your family without being your necessarily genetic family. Um, mm -hmm. And so what you end up is both patterns of genetic similarity that are very, very old, much older than 5,000 years. But at the same time, when we're talking about, you know, uh, genealogy, that connection of identity, who begat whom, we don't have to go back very far to find a place where we're all connected. My word. Do you always inherit something from like each parent? Because I look a lot like my mum. I'm always told I look like my mum. Don't look as much mm -hmm. like my dad. But there must, is it that unless, you know, because I'm much taller than both of them as well. And we we don't, I mean, we didn't didn't have a tall postman or something or milkman. That was yeah. a joke they, they made to me <laughs> as a kid. But is, will I have definitely something from both? Yeah. So you will definitely have something from your mom and your dad right? So 50% of your genes are from your mom, 50% of your genes are from your dad. Um, where you start to get drop off is going back further generations, right? Okay. So your mom has 50% from her mom and her dad, and her mom has 50% from her mom and her dad. And it's, are you guaranteed to have gotten something from your great grandparent, your great, great grandparent, your great, that's when you start to see this attrition. So as the genome gets recombined and reshuffled into 
um, with every new generation, there's also the possibility of one of the bits of DNA that come from a distant ancestor um, not coming through um, in, in the. And then the other thing with height, you know, height's a great example of something that's very heritable in the sense that, you know, for a given group of people in a given time, you know, in England or in the United States, most of the differences between people and how tall they are is their genes, um, a huge part of it. But you also see big generational differences, historical increases in height because in, nutrition has improved and prenatal care has improved. And, you know, you're bigger when you're born, that sort of thing. So my children's dad is um, 6'2", 6'3", he's a fairly tall man. And when I met his grandmother, I was shocked that she was maybe the tiniest human I've ever met. She was like 4'10", uh, because she grew up in a impoverished town in Poland where they didn't have good nutrition. So you see both this continuity across time, but also this incredible capacity for change as environments change and improve. Is When you get a, like a very short father and tall mother or vice versa, so they've got the gene for tallness or yeah. height or whatever, um, I guess like the layperson tendency was to look at them and go, okay, so that means their son will be in the middle because there's the there's one has the tall and one has the short. But that's I'm starting to think that's obviously not how it works. It's you will get one or the other. Well, so I think the first thing is not there's not the tall gene, right? So okay. there's um thousands upon thousands upon thousands of genetic differences between people, all of which make you infinitesimally taller or infinitesimally shorter. And so, um, you know, your father has a combination of those, your mother has a combination of those, and then you're drawing at random from that pool. And so what you see is actually this incredible amount of variation between siblings who have the same parents mm -hmm. in um, how many sort of height increasing genes they get. So there's a figure wow. in my book where I say, you know, let's say that you look at the, you know, the range of heights you can have in the whole population. Now look at the range of heights that you can have in the children of just one pair of parents. It's that range is smaller. The, you know, your chances of getting extremes is less. Um, but it's, there's still an incredible amount of variation that can happen there. Um, and so that, that role of randomness I think is underappreciated when you're thinking about what you can get from mom and what you can get from dad. So genes are, okay, uh, yeah. things that are in your <laughs> like body and you've got DNA. Yeah. And But can you, because I've seen diagrams my whole life, right? And there's that, what's it called? A double helix or something? Helix, like this, yes, exactly. Right? And you see that, but that can't be what it looks like inside my body. Are there not millions of these little helix things that if you could, if I got small <laughs> enough, I could actually see them twisting around me, could I? Yeah, well, so everything does have, you know, your DNA does have this double helix structure. Um, but if it were totally unwound into this double helix structure, it would be too large and messy to fit in all your cells. So what's happening is that the DNA is being wound around itself um, and very tightly, tightly packaged um, into something that can fit in the nucleus of your cell. And so there's a whole nother layer of information about how is that DNA molecule, which is enormous, unfolding so that the rest of, so that it can be read, so that it can be used by the rest of the cellular machinery. It's enormously complicated. I mean, just, um, you know, it's amazing that it's amazing that we can read the differences in people's DNA. I mean, it's absolutely astounding if yeah. you think about it. Um, you know, I I've been pregnant twice, and with my son, when I was pregnant, um, I didn't do any sort of genetic testing, um, and I didn't have an amniocentesis or anything like that. And with my daughter, they just took a sample of my blood when I was eight weeks pregnant. So, you know, four weeks after a missed period. And then they were able to isolate her DNA out of my blood and call me and say, you're having a girl because we can see that there's two X chromosomes. I mean, that's just absolutely astounding, right? That we have this tool um, that allows us to see inside the human body in that way. Yeah. 
I oh man, it just blows my mind the whole thing. Yeah. Because oh, there's also right there's <laughs> there's one there's one strand that actually affects me, and then there's another strand that's on reserve for when I have kids to sort of get in the mix. Is that right? Not quite. So what happens is you have um, so there's uh, there's two strands of DNA. Um, that are winding around each other. But there's also two copies of that, one that you inherited from your mother and one that you inherited from your father. So each copy is this double-stranded helix. And it's not that you're using one and not using the other. Um, in some cases with women who have two X chromosomes, part of the second X is deactivated. But um, oftentimes, most of what we're looking at are genetic effects where you could have gotten zero copies of something from neither parent, one copy from one from your mom or your dad or two copies. And um, it's not the, 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 the action of getting one copy might often be kind of in between having two copies or zero copies. So it's not like there's like a silent version. And then when you have kids, what happens is that um or not even when you have kids, when you make sperm, every time you make sperm, your mom's genes and your dad's genes that you inherited from them are getting shuffled together into totally new combinations. So um, this is why, you know, I keep returning to this figure in the book that, you know, you and a partner, there are 70 trillion possible combinations of your genes that you could pass on to your kids, right? It is a huge lottery every time. Um, so that's that it's not like it's a reserve. It is, you know, what you've inherited is being mixed up in a new way every time you you create a sperm cell. Theoretically, if you had 70 trillion kids, which I don't think I think you can only have a certain amount of <laughs> eggs, right? <laughs> yeah. You would produce the same the exact same child twice, which I guess is like identical <sighs> twins. Oh, you know, that's an interesting if you had like infinite eggs and infinite um infinite sperm so what you do see is um i mean not quite like having the same kid twice but you can look at you know if you have multiple kids how similar are they to each other and the expected average is 50 percent, but they might have happened to get more similar combinations or less similar combinations there's a great study that i love by the um geneticist peter visher where he looks at this in a sample of siblings and on average, siblings share about 50% of their genes, um, but some siblings are um, as little as 30% and some siblings are as much as like 75%, which is just random chance, right? Again, this is the law of large numbers. If you do something enough, occasionally really weird things happen. They so, you know, someone ends up on the tails of the distribution. When you share an, an, an actual bit of DNA with somebody, yeah. so my mum or my brother, is it? Is it? Does that mean in that? Oh, I guess it's lots of combinations that come together for personality traits and stuff. There is what I'm yeah. what I'm getting to is I sometimes see in my brother a certain look or a grimace or something like that, and I know <laughs> like I know that I'm the only one who spotted it because I know it because it's me and he's done exactly yeah. what I did. Do we? Is it? Is it like identical? What we have the same instruction manual. <laughs> So it's so it's, that's such an interesting question. So there are spots on your genome, stretches of it, where you and your brother are identical. I have this figure in my book where I show me and my brother Micah, and you know, on some yes. stretches of our genome, we're like twins, and then some we're like strangers, right? You're forty six percent, I think, or something. Or, yes, or, or, exa- uh, yeah, I think we're right at forty eight percent. Yeah. 40, yeah. Um, so. Um, but then what effect does that have on the similarity that we share as siblings? And that is the really interesting, really hard scientific question, which is how do you figure out I'm like my brother, you're like your brother because we inherited the same genes versus we were raised by the same parents or we were raised in the same neighborhood. Um, that is an incredibly tricky question. Um, that requires a lot of cleverness, I think, to try to disentangle those things. Hmm. The more you've gotten into this work, have you started to, uh, I mean, I'm going to get into free will and determinism. Have you started <laughs> to just, are we just actors on a stage? Is Are we just doing what our G- DNA is saying and that's it? Um, 
you know, that's such a, that's such a common question. And, you know, sometimes I joke like the, the, you know, in my word, in my world, the F word is not the F word, it's free will. Um, (laughs) I think it's, I, I really think it's the wrong question to ask about genes. And this is why, which is that if we're talking about, do humans have free will? Do we live in a clockwork universe where everything was determined before the dawn of time and then if that's true then that's true for everything and that's true for everyone and it doesn't really matter if the causes of things are genetics versus physics versus environments you know richard dawkins has a the uh, the geneticist has a line which is this if you believe in determinism the addition of the word genetic doesn't change anything right it's just it's um hmm you know, what, what difference does it make if you're determined by genes versus determined by you happen to see someone walking down the street today, right? Like if if everything's determined, I'm more interested in which aspects of our life do we have more agency and freedom over and which do we have less? Are there people who have less elbow room by virtue of genetics that have um, robbed them of some of their um, their freedom. And I think schizophrenia is a great example of that. Uh, you have less room to make choices when you are suffering from compulsions or psychoses. Um, so all of that to say, I'm interested in differences between people mm-hmm. and differences in your life, in different domains of your life. Um, and I don't think that free will is the right frame of reference for those questions because free will is kind of all or nothing um and not really about how people differ in the freedom they have in their lives does that Mm. make sense that's that's kind of a long answer to your question it does make sense although i still don't know if you believe in free will or determinism (laughs) but but, (laughs) you know i know what you mean though I, I don't know. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I've heard scientists talk about quantum level things that might have some randomness. Yeah. And then if there's randomness, but then you could say that randomness itself is is not you. You're not doing it. It's yeah. happening inside you. I mean, do I believe in free will? I honestly, I to be perfectly honest, I don't know. And I'm not, I guess I'm not that interested in the question in the sense mm. that like, I feel like it's a very metaphysical question. Yeah. And answering it doesn't tell us how we should treat people in, in the world that we live in, where we at least feel like some people have responsibility and agency for their choices. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I kind of resist the free will framing. I get that. And I, I think regardless, we have to act as though there is free will, because otherwise we'll just yes. be a bunch of nihilists, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Speaking of schizophrenia or schizophrenia, people who stay in higher education are more curious, but are also more likely to have nervous conditions like OCD and schizophrenia. Tell me about that. Yeah, so it's a really interesting thing that we see from looking at um, uh, the data from large-scale genetic studies. So if you're just looking at what scientists call phenotypes, which are you know people's observable characteristics, we know that Um, People who have schizophrenia are less likely to complete their education and have um, not just what psychiatrists call positive symptoms, such as listening to voices or believing things that aren't true, but severe cognitive symptoms in terms of their working memory or their processing speed, which makes it really hard um, to, to go very far in school. At the same time, we see that people who don't have a diagnosis, don't have the full-blown illness, but have some characteristics of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, um, elevated mood, creative thinking, often do amazingly well in creative fields or in scientific fields. If we look at the genetic data, what we see is that some of the genetic variants associated with going further in school are also correlated with this higher likelihood of developing schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And I think that that information is really useful because it helps push us out of this thinking that there are good genes and bad genes, right? And the the origin of the word eugenics is good gene, right? It's projecting our notions of good and bad down into the DNA. Um, But that's not actually 
the, those kind of distinctions between good genes and bad genes um, are not nearly as kind of neat or pat as many people would like um, would like them to make them out to be. Um, some of the things that help us in one context can hurt us in other contexts. Um, and so uh, this idea that, for instance, we should always, um, be aiming for, you know, having the most education increasing genes possible um, doesn't really make scientific sense. I don't think it makes moral sense, but I also think it doesn't make much scientific sense too. And yet it's quite extraordinary. I, I guess one of the of the main premises of your book is about how we have, well, not we, I haven't done anything, but a lot of people have <laughs> identified um, certain variations of genes that are, that corresponds are causal. I'm just it's all the all the words I'm thinking about the way are causal in their relationship to education, how long people stay in it. Yeah. So gosh, I'm glad that you're spending time on is it correspondent or causal? Because that in and of itself mm. is a huge scientific debate. So the most common studies are correlation studies. So they simply say these genes are more common in people that have gone further in school. Um, does that mean that there's something about the genome that's causing people to go further in school is a harder question to answer. And this is why the, um, the looking at family members, looking at parents and children, looking at siblings is so important scientifically, because when we're talking about um, compared to your parents' genome, which ones, which genes did you get? There's an element of randomness to that that allow scientists to be on firmer footing when they're trying to go from these genes are correlated to these genes are causal. Um, so I think, you know, we, we talk about genes in kind of two different ways. And one is like genes writ large, like something in your genome, something in your DNA. And then we also talk about it in terms of like these specific genes. So I think we know that your genes generally, something in your DNA is causing some people to go further in school. Um, and then we've identified some specific variants that are correlated with going further in school, but which of those are actually causal is, mm. is the really interesting scientific puzzle right now. And and that's what you're and what what do you where do you stand on that? Do you think there are I guess I guess the education thing, it's really tough because does it mean people are brighter and more intelligent, or does it mean that somebody because there are some people who left school at fifteen or sixteen who are super smart and ambitious in a different yes. way? And so yeah, what can we learn? So I mean I think this gets back to the question of like um it, this is a very professor thing to say, but like what do we mean by cause? And so I think when people hear genetic causes, they tend to think of things working like Huntington's disease or Down syndrome, where, where genes are, have very strong effects and it, they're going to exert those effects sort of regardless of what the environment is. Whereas I think that most genes in terms of their effects on education don't work like that at all. I think that they are more like the role of, um, does being on Twitter more, you know, make you more depressed, right? Like it could under some circumstances raise your probability of being depressed, but there's a lot of ifs and ands and buts about it. And I think that's, a, you know, when we're talking about genetic influence on education, we're talking about, does this genetic variant change the probability on average of you going a little bit further in school, but there's going to be so many other things that also come into play in that equation. Mm. And what if we do have an idea, if we do start to get a clearer idea that certain genes give some people advantages in the society we live yeah. in today, what does that mean for our approach at uh, equality and redressing imbalance? Yeah. Well, I think the thing to remember is that there's already so much work going on attempting to redress, in, redress inequalities in education via changes to children's school environments and changes to children's home environments and changes to the kind of neighborhoods that children live in, right? And this is, a you know, a constant churn of trying to figure out um, 
you know, if we change class size, if we add tutoring programs, if we intervene on children's mindsets, if we track them, if we detract them, if we give schools more money, if we give schools money with these strings attached, right? Like this is a constant process. Um, almost all of that research, almost all of those efforts to, to change kids' um, educational outcomes and mitigate inequalities are, almost all of those things are spectacularly unsuccessful, like actually in a really depressing way. So, you know, if you look at, if you look at reviews of like what works in education in the U S here, we have something called the what works clearinghouse. Um, and the short answer is not much. <laughs> there's, there's shockingly few things that we know how to do that reliably improve educational outcomes for kids particularly in ways that help disadvantaged kids more such that those gaps are closed. So when I think about the, about the power of genetics, I think about it not in terms of knowing something about an individual kid's biology. I'm thinking about it as how can we improve that situation? How can we make psychology and education and sociology more effective at figuring out what works? And in order to do that, I think we need to have a much clearer understanding of which environments are the most influential for kids. So I, I often say that the lesson of genetics isn't that the environment doesn't matter. The environment matters. It's figuring out which environments matter the most for which kids. That's really hard. So um, the, the, the lowest hanging fruit for genetics right now is as a, a variable that psychologists and education researchers and sociologists take into account in their research designs to kind of get it out of the way so that they're better at identifying which environments matter, right? So all of our policies and interventions, everyone, they're all based on a model of how the world works. If I change this, this will happen. The better our models of how the world works are, the more likely our, our policies and interventions will succeed. And right now, many of our models of the world are very flawed because they're based on research that assumes the only thing that kids inherit from their parents are their environments. Um, and if you have this kind of flawed assumption in the heart of many research designs, I think it's not really a wonder why we keep failing to identify which environments are going to be the most effective levers of change for improving kids' lives. So that's what I think we should do with genetics. Um, not, uh, you know, it's, it, which is funny in a way, because when I start talking about this, people immediately are like, is this Gattaca? Are we going to be like breeding designer babies? And I'm like, yeah. no, I want better statistical models for professors doing research, right? It's like a much more boring um, on its face application, but I think it is the application that has by far the most power to improve children's lives. So it's it's teachers and professors being aware of each of their, their pupils' genomes and going, okay, well, he needs this kind of attention and, and that one, that one. No, not even that. It's, it's not even like a teacher in the... So you can say there's a teacher in the classroom and they have 30 kids. And, um, you know, I'm not even suggesting that that teacher knows anything about their students' genomes. I'm saying that when a researcher goes in and says, well, the kids in this class are doing better on average than the kids in this class not immediately jumping to the conclusion that it's something about what the teacher is doing, but considering that kids are different from one another. And we need to take that into account in order to identify um, whether it's actually something about the teacher or the school, right? So this is, I think this is more obvious when we're not talking about genes. Like if we, if we're comparing um, two schools in the US and they all took their government mandated exams, and the kids in this school performed better on average than the kids in this school. Um, and people said, um, well, you can't say that it's about what the school is doing because the kids in this school are poorer on average than these. You know, maybe it's nothing about the school. Maybe it's about some characteristic of the students. You have to recognize that the students are different. It's the same thing with genes, right? You can have concentrations of kids who have different likelihoods to succeed in school 
in different classrooms and different school districts and different places. And that makes it very, very hard to identify. Is there something about this educational practice that's actually working that we should model and replicate and teach other teachers to do it? Or does this teacher just happen to have a bunch of kids who are statistically likely to, to go on to do well in education? And disentangling those things is an incredibly difficult problem, but also an incredibly important problem to solve if we want to improve educational outcomes for children. There still is a, quite, a, quite a large difference in outcomes at private schools compared to state schools, for example. Like, I mean, does that mean that environment does have an impact, but just not as much as maybe p- people think? I think the, you know, the private school versus the state school example is a great one for illustrating how little we know. So is it that private school students are go on to do better things because the private schools are doing something different that we should teach state school teachers to do? Or is it because the types of families who have the resources to send their kids to private schools the types of students who go to private schools, which are very selected, are different and they would go on to be better at, you know, in their education and labor market problems, sort of regardless of what happened. Those are very different answers to that question. And we don't know the answer to that question, which is kind of shocking. Why don't we know the answer to that question is because disentangling what is actually causing the kids to do better versus what are they bringing to the table with their own background is a really, it's a really difficult problem. And now we have this amazing tool where we can measure kids' genetics, right? Like, let's use it. Like, let's actually use that tool that we have um, in that, you know, we've never been able to use before to bring to bear to this problem of figuring out what works for kids. Are you concerned that this kind of tool in the wrong hands could go awry? I'm, I'm getting into the exciting dystopi- dystopian yeah. stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that is the danger with any technology that has the power to improve the world also has the power to make it worse. If we think about the automobile, if we think about the internet, if we think about television, These are technological advances that have made lives better and introduced new policy problems of how do we use this technology, how do we regulate it in a way that that works for people. And there's no reason to think that genetics again, we've been talking about how mind-blowing it is we can do this. There's no reason to think that, you know, the the genetics is any different than the internet or the automobile in terms of its power to be a disruptive technology for good, but also a disruptive technology for harm. Um, Mm. And that's, that's all powerful tools, I think. Yeah. What's the worst possible thing you can imagine? Or or do you not want to speak about that? Because it might distract from... (laughs) You know, the worst possible thing I can imagine, which is not that unlikely, is that all of this is going to become irrelevant because of the massive disruption that's coming from climate change and all of the fallout from that. And we're not going to be talking about DNA. We're going to be talking about much more basic human needs like water and our houses not being underwater um, and uh, uh, surviving sort of uh, increasingly cataclysmic climate events. So if you're going if you want my existential dread, it's not about DNA, it's about climate actually. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. But what if the climate survives and it would yeah. be such a shame if that happened because you've put so much work in and you know scientists collectively have and then you wouldn't be able to yeah. use it. It would be like, well what use is that when we're still trying to make fires and stuff around a camp because the yeah. climate ruined everything. Um or we ruined it. Yeah, I mean I think when people are thinking about you know there are fears around this. We don't have to do that much imagining. We have a historical legacy, you know, in the U S genetic links between, you know, with, with quote unquote intelligence or with education were used to support laws that allowed for the forcible sterilization of women um, that allowed for immigration policies that discriminated against um, people from certain nations. 
Um, and we exported those laws straight out to Nazi Germany. I mean, they modeled their laws on American laws that, um, you know, obviously committed atrocities and genocide. So, you know, when people are saying they're worried, they're worried because of the historical associations between, um, uh, you know, between thinking about genetics at all and those atrocities. Um, I don't, I'm not, I think I'm often accused of being naive or, or not taking those fears seriously. And I, the thing is, is that I do, um, at the same time, going back to our earlier conversation, I don't think it's news anymore that genes matter for people's lives, right? So I think the idea that if scientists stop talking about it, then we can avoid the risk of atrocity because I, you know, people won't know or something that, that genetics has power. Um, I think that is, I think that is naive that people don't already think about this and how it plays out in their society and their lives. That, that the, the genetics genie is already out of the bottle. I think less dystopianly, um, I would be really depressed if in 40 years we were still having this conversation, right? If there was one camp of people being like, your research designs are flawed and we can't find, you know, figure out what works for kids because you're not taking into account this thing. And other people are saying, no, we should never talk about it. That um, a lot of times I say that we shouldn't be talking about Gattaca. We should be talking about Groundhog Day. Um, uh, and I think if the Groundhog Day of the current conversation continued for another couple decades, that would be real. That, that would be really depressing for me. But I get what you're saying totally because uh, I, I've been myself. I've been the, the position you're in is very difficult, um, and I've been looking into pedophilia, a totally different thing, nothing to do with it. But that's why I, I, I sort of embedded myself with with these people. I was living in Berlin, and they have a clinic there. It's the only clinic in the world where they never um, they never ever uh, report their patients. Uh, minor attracted persons they call them to authorities and it's the only way to get them in and that's why that really hit home what you said about if we don't all look into this then it's sort of the bad guys who have all the information and it's not like it's going to go away um, and the people right now who know the most about all the statistics around pedophilia are pedophiles right they're in their communities and stuff they know a lot uh, wow yeah, so I, I think we need to talk a lot more about t taboo subjects, which is why, you know, eugenics and genes and things, like, why not talk about it? It's, it doesn't mean that we're instantly going to become white supremacists or Nazis or so. It's, it's so that they're not the only ones who have that information. Yeah, so that they're not the only ones kind of, um, you know, do, making sense of that knowledge. I mean, I think what's so hard about that and I'm feeling myself have my own reactions to, you know, thinking about you talking with people at a pedophilia clinic is um, to what extent is, is being in conversation or responding to um, giving the appearance of kind of tacit approval or like a lack of condemnation, right? Like in order to get information from people about how they see the world or what's happening, um, you have to talk to them. And I think on the other hand, we have these really strong moral intuitions around shunning and shaming and punishing with, for very good reason, which is the opposite of being in conversation with. And so like, how do you um, communicate moral clarity and condom, you know, moral condemnation appropriately. So, um, while also not abdicating the task of meaning making, um, around a complicated subject. And I think that's a really fine, um, mm -hmm. you know, higher wire act to, that to is, walk that right is, there. that is exactly it. That is the issue. I mean, what, what's been explained to me by clinicians, uh, in this, in this clinic in Berlin, uh, is you basically get three kinds of minor attracted persons. You get the sort of psychopathic pedophile who is going to do what he does anyway. And they, I say he because they are the vast majority are men. You get ones who will never, ever offend, so you don't have to worry about them. And then you get the murky middle terrain of people who probably don't want to, but they might fall for their own cognitive bias. So they say, the clinicians, that there are three 
um, risk factors, major risk factors for them offending. And one of them is alcohol and drugs and things like that, of course, because it lowers their inhibitions. Another one is um, being in close proximity to children. And the third one is stigmatization, which we find a lot with offenders, offenders who are welcomed into a society or told like, hey, we can make things work for you, are less likely to go back and offend. So them being allowed to go into therapy without, for example, the, the outside the clinic in Berlin, somebody keeps graffitiing, hang the pedos, uh, hang the pedophiles. Uh, and obviously it makes them feel more stigmatized and it might make that person feel good writing hang the ped pedophiles, but it might make that person go and abuse another child. So it's just, I think it's, it is really difficult and it is that, that balance that you're talking about. But uh, I just feel like yeah. from talking about it and actually allowing these people to go to therapy, if they're seeking therapy, then they are, they are you know, they don't want to offend and they need to be taught about yeah. their own cognitive biases and things like that. Otherwise, they, they get into communities on their own, just like that's why I was thinking about the eugenics example. They're on their own in a community where they only talk to each other and they tell each other things and they tell each other, you know, oh, I know loads of kids who were abused and they were fine. Ut utter nonsense. But that's what they tell each other. So that's why I feel like we need to talk more about it as a, as yeah. a community. You know, I mean, we've, we've kind of wandered af away from the book, but just in response to that, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like that particular example of that stigmatization, it, I feel like it puts into conflict two very different intuitions or beliefs that can be quite strongly held about, about what is punishment for Right. So mm -hmm. is punishment consequentialist to, you know, stop or de-incentivize some other outcome that you, you know, you don't want. So in this case, children being abused or is punishment our, our sense of, you know, moral outrage of an act and its badness and that suffering is deserved regardless, actually, if it's, you know, it also has kind of bad consequences to it. And I think um, so many of our debates where we have these kind of like moral battles waged on empirical grounds get so a lot of their fervor because people are coming into the conversations with really different ideas about what punishment is for or whether something is a means to an end or an end itself. And to, to bring it back to the genetics conversation, you know, I'm out here making very much a sort of consequentialist instrumental argument that like, I think talking about genetics is good because it allows us to use this tool, which allows us to get to this other end that we care about, which is improving education for kids. But I, you know, part of the audience that I will always miss and never speak to with that argument is one that thinks linking genetics to behavior is bad, full stop. You know, it doesn't matter what good can come of it. Like, that idea in and of itself is a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, to the extent that someone believes that, you know, my arguments about the instrumental value of doing this research are, are they're going to forever fall on deaf ears, right? There's nothing, there's nowhere we can mm -hmm. go. Someone called you a, a Holocaust denier. Is that right? In, the, in your book, you mentioned ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> well, so it's interesting that, you know, this, the, the New Yorker recently had an article about me and the book where there was some detail about that exchange and you know so many of the reactions for people have been like that's ridiculous or that's absurd or he's the villain of the piece and I don't actually see him that way at all I see the person who called me that as someone who genuinely believes that this idea of linking genes and behavior is itself a bad thing to do and he did me a favor I think by expressing his condemnation of the idea in such stark terms that I couldn't sidestep it and I couldn't ignore it. You know, I, I had to think about where is this coming from? And even though I don't agree with him, I think having to think through what is the nature of that objection has ultimately made my, my work stronger. So I'm actually quite grateful to him for that criticism. Are you just saying that because you know that will wind him up more? <laughs> no, I, I don't think it, I mean, um, you know, it's 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 an interesting thing, the kind of asymmetry sometimes in which people have a lot of problems with your work, but you you actually quite respect them and like them as people. And I think this is one of the cases in which there's an asymmetry there. And I wish it weren't there, um, but I 
I, I, I still think this is important to talk about. Yeah, no, of course it is. Of course it is. And I understand, you know, and, and all views are welcome. It's just that I, I, I think my own, uh, personally, I, I sort of, it gets my back up a bit when people want to close down discussion uh, for fear of what something. And it's like, no, I want them to engage with it, really listen and really try and understand. It. And, you know, history is littered with people who have gone, no, no, that's bad because, you know, back to Copernicus and, and all. Wait, was he the one that was punished or was it? Who was the other one? Copernicus and the other. Who was the other one who got put in prison? Galileo. Galileo, magnifico. Um, I didn't do that. I wasn't trying to make make you do the Queen song. Um, <laughs> you know, the, just just that. Oh, I, I, that makes me feel bad and stressed. So I'm going to shut down this person. I just think I, I want I want to I want to engage. By the way, what what was it you were arguing with Sam Harris, the the world's most famous neuroscientist, about? <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. You know, that dates back um, a couple years because Sam Harris had um, Charles Murray, who co-authored The Bell Curve with Dick Hernstein in the 90s, um, uh, on his show to talk about, um, they called the show Forbidden Knowledge. And um, I co-authored with my former PhD mentor, Eric Turkheimer, and another psychologist, a response to that podcast in Vox. Um, and then it turns out that it seemed to have tripped um, a little bit of an uh, ongoing conflict between Sam Harris and Ezra Klein, who was um, uh, editing Vox at the time. And so um, it sort of spiraled from there. And then... Um, several years later, I guess in the summer of 2020, Sam invited me on his podcast to actually talk about the, the, you know, my criticism of how he presented Murray's work and his criticism of how I criticized him and to have a conversation about that, which I was, you know, again, very appreciative of. I mean, Sam has a enormous platform and I think, um, having the opportunity to talk to him about, um, you know, where our locus of conflict was, I think was really, uh, was really useful for me. And I appreciated that. I don't think that I changed his mind and I don't think that he changed my mind. Mm. Um, but I do think we were able to have a conversation where we communicated where we disagreed, um, pretty clearly. So Sam, from what I can gather, he believes that developments in gene science will show differences between groups of human populations, namely intelligence and, and other things that we care about. And you were on the other side of that. Oh, well, yeah. So I don't, I mean, I don't think that as the science progress, we're going to find any racial genetic differences on cognitive characteristics like intelligence. I just don't buy that as a scientific hypothesis, although people disagree with me. Um, I also think that we disagree. And, and it sounds like you, I might actually be closer to Sam on this than I am about the value of speculating about that possibility in the absence of evidence. So I think that, you know, he's, appears to be on the side of we should be able to talk about this as a possibility like let's not shut down debate um whereas i'm on the side of um uh you know everything is possible but not everything is beneficial not every idea um is worth debating given the paucity of evidence for it and the degree to which it is inflammatory and potentially harmful to people. So for me, the conversation is more of a risk benefit analysis rather than this kind of um, uh, holding up the, the ability to kind of debate any idea you want sort of above all other values or considerations. Um, I wonder, I mean, I say all that, I wonder how um, Sam will respond to that. I mean, I, in many ways, these, these, these conversations are a little bit of a projective test. Uh, I was amazed at how many different responses there were to my conversation with Sam Harris. It, to read the emails that I got, you would think these people did not listen to the same conversation. Uh, like they were wildly divergent. Yeah. Well, that's that's also a tribal thing, isn't it? Because when someone's as big as Sam, they get these followers. Um, I've yeah. had it before with, you know, Jordan Peterson. And he had an argue, he had a, a, a big debate with a, a feminist called Helen, Helen Lewis. Did you see that on okay. GQ? I, um, vaguely. Yeah, I don't, I, um, I'm not familiar with the contours of that. 
Uh, so I, I watched that and I just thought like, wow, these two intellects who are on different sides, but they also agree in some ways. What what genius. I was so impressed by both of them. And I had Helen Lewis on the show. And honestly, it's my most commented on YouTube video. And it's everyone, everything is negative because it's all Jordan Peterson's very tribal uh, fans. And they're having a go at me going, oh, why do you hate Jordan Peterson? And having a go at her. And I just thought it's so unfair because she she wouldn't, she wasn't really having a go at him. So they just disagree in the same way as you and Sam Harris, I think. And Jordan Peterson probably wouldn't want people to be that tribal and that ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So that must have been happening with, I mean, Sam Harris must have his own, when he's that big, he must have his own sort of groupies and things yeah. as un- unwanted perhaps, but they're, they're there. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, a, that, that is, a, you know, that's one thing that surprised me is, um, um, you know, I'm, I, I will confess to you, even though we're doing a podcast, I'm not a big podcast listener. And so I think I can underestimate the, <laughs> the size of people's audiences. Um, you know, I don't quite know what I'm getting myself into when I wander into these things. Um, you know, it, it, when I think about that, um, I was actually just having this conversation with my father uh, over text message last night, because watching him watching responses to my book, I think is a really eye-opening experience for him to think, oh my gosh, I know this person and look how they're responding to you. And um, Positively. Oh my gosh, is this what it's like to be on the internet? I think it was, I think it's actually quite, <laughs> quite eye-opening. And we ended up into this conversation about like, well, what do you do with that? Like, what do you do with the fact that you can see evidence of tribalism or people responding without actually really engaging with an idea. And for me, it comes back to um, how can I take the criticism that's useful and how can I examine my own life for the ways in which I'm tribal or lazy or unself-reflective, which we all have. And that is, um, you know, taking, taking it as a reminder that we all have work to do in terms of the, the, depth of our engagement with difficult mm. controversial ideas well it's, it sounds you know from your book you describe the people who go furthest in education are curious and open so that's what you have that's what you seem to be describing and i imagine with your qualifications you have gone or went very far in further education and and it is very hard to take anything uh good from the internet when they're having a go at you <laughs> So, so if you take anything, the fact that you took something, um, somebody calling you a Holocaust denier or whatever, and you can take something, I think that's quite remarkable. Um, I just, the other day, I, I asked J.K. Rowling to come on the podcast. It was just that. Uh, I'm yeah. a huge Harry Potter fan. I've read all the books a mm-hmm. bunch of times. And obviously the whole trans thing, I would just want to ask uh, about it, you know, without having an opinion myself. The amount of people who wrote back with such vitriol saying, oh, you're a transphobe for asking her on, you're transphobe and and she's a mm-hmm. transphobe. And why don't you have someone who doesn't hate people on your podcast? And I was like, you know, I thought, what can I get from this? What can you glean from that? Yeah, I mean, I what I think about that is, I mean, you're in a position of power as a podcaster. I think anyone who has a platform is, um, you know, you are... Um, you know, you, you are giving people an opportunity to share their ideas. And that's, I mean, that's an amazing thing. Like as an academic, I think about how many people have read one of my scholarly papers versus how many people have heard about an idea because I talked to someone like you. Um, and so, I mean, I, if I'm going to just give you totally unsolicited advice on the fly, Please. I think what I would, <laughs> I think I would take from that is, an opportunity to be curious about um, even if I'm not going to change my mind about inviting Rowling on, um, is there a way in which I can um, use my platform to give voice to um, someone who has a different view from her or whose voice am I, whose voices are, am, am I not, kind of uplifting and, and spotlighting. Um, so I think, in, you know, there's always, there's always this, that kind of defensive response to critique. There's the retaliatory response to critique. There's the like, fuck it, I'm going to do whatever I want <laughs> response to critique. There's the paralysis response to critique. And then I think underneath all of that, there's the like, what can I do differently that 
nudges this in a slightly different direction. And so, you know, maybe have Rowling on and then maybe have a trans activist who really disagrees with her on and, mm. um, and platform both of those views. Perhaps there's another. I think that's all exactly right. But there's an there's another ingredient in doing the podcast, which is sort of entertainment, and so sometimes <laughs> more worthy people, although correct and and although their voices deserve to be heard as much, if not more, um, their views are maybe not as entertaining. And there is an entertainment aspect to a podcast. So yeah, I guess I you know so to have J.K. Rowling, her views are so inflammatory. Even if I'm pushing her and saying, well, hang on, that's not fair or whatever people are going to listen and also she's jk rowling she made harry potter whereas somebody who has just a worthy good point and i'm going oh well, that's that's very true you're right that's not always uh that exciting i've always when i've made documentaries i've always gone for like super right-wing people i did one about uh, abortion and i st- stayed with a uh, a fervent pro-lifer who people call the mm-hmm. crazy baby lady her views are i think ab- ab- abhorrent the way she is and, but it was much more exciting to be with her for me than with uh, just a, a pro-choice who's just saying things that a lot of my friends would say and it's the entertainment aspect although it's not it's not necessarily fair yeah I mean I, I I think I have to I think the place I would push back against that is mm. I think it underestimates I think it may, might you might be underestimating your audience a little bit I mean I don't know I don't know your audience um but <laughs> you know yeah. what one you know in my own work, when I was putting, you know, thinking about putting together a book, I ended up in it as a, you know, at an academic press with a, you know, a science editor who really allowed me to um, write it as a scientist with a lot of nuance and a lot of qualification. Yes, we can say this, but we can't go so far. And this is where we're uncertain. And this is where the problem is still hard. And a lot of people warned me you know, you're never going to sell any books. It's never going to get any attention. You need to be out there with the kind of the flashiest version of the argument. And I was like, but that's not the version of the argument that I think is true. And I, I'm not going to just go for entertainment value. And what I've heard from so many people is, you know, on the one hand, it it's possible that it's not as going to be as a big a book as it could be if I went for the kind of the flashiest and your words, most entertaining version of the argument. Um, but it's a book that I I feel like has integrity. And I also hear from a lot of people that they are hungry for nuance, that they're hungry for context, that they're hungry for um, you know, not everything being the culture wars turned up to 11, um, but people thinking about uncertainty and being willing to say, um, I'm pretty sure about this and I'm less sure about that. So I think... I wonder if there's a segment of your audience that is, you know, um, might want more of the nuanced voices. Um, Mm. And I also have to think about like, it's not, yes, you you are looking for entertainment, but like, what are your responsibilities as a creator too? Mm. I think you've got more responsibilities as a scientist. I'm an entertainer, but I do, I do. (laughs) As as the listenership grows, I I appreciate that. And it's funny, actually, the very first episodes was more than a year ago. Uh, I was on somebody's podcast last night who had been, we all, it's, it's like, it's incestuous, you know, we're all on each other's things all the time, yeah. it's promoting each other. And I was on a, a guy called Eric Hunley, who's who's great uh, American interviewer. And he said he listened to, he did a lot of research and he listened to a lot of my episodes. And he said, at the beginning, you were quite angry and quite one-sided about things. And as it went on, you did become uh and I think he said he was criticizing actually because he, I think he likes that really sort of one sided thing. Um, but I think you're right that with a, a larger audience, you do start to feel that responsibility. And then you've got people like Joe Rogan, who I'm a huge fan of, uh, although I don't listen regularly. But you know, Joe Rogan, do you know, you know of him? He lives in Austin. I don't, I don't <laughs> listen to Joe Rogan, but I, I do know who he is. I mean, he's getting millions of people listening every week. He could like dwarf even Sam Harris, who's one of the biggest in the world. It's ridiculous. And then he comes out with this stuff about vaccines. And it's like, and he does preface it with, I'm not an expert, but. But even that is like, you're, you do have more responsibility, Joe. And that's, it's concerning. That part about what are people's responsibilities is really important to me. And I think if you want to benefit from the things that come from having a platform, 
you know, listeners and being able to talk about ideas and being able to interact with interesting people, um, then with that privilege comes responsibility around how you use your platform. And responsibility, I think so often is couched as the opposite of freedom. You know, I should be able to free, you know, I should, it's my podcast. I should be able to free to, you know, free to have um, who I want on. Um, Whereas I think of it not as freedom versus responsibility, but the ways in which um, I'm contributing to a dialogue that will ultimately be more free if I don't abdicate my responsibility Mm. towards nuance and context. That's a lot of pressure. (laughs) You can rise to the occasion. (laughs) I can't. I absolutely can't. Okay, I got one last question. I'm sorry, it's it's gone on a bit longer. This is the... Oh, is it? it? (laughs) Yeah. It's oh, it's cut out a little bit. Oh, Have you I just cut froze. Oh no! Um, is it my side? Shit! The internet connection is unstable. I'm just gonna open this. I'm gonna open this door. See if that. Okay. Because there's a Wi-Fi. Hang on. One second. I'm gonna I'm gonna pop down and move the the router so it's slightly nearer. Oh, just run up, run down the stairs and move the. I'm just out of shape. <laughs> oh. It's good. Get the heart rate up. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't. I had two years of lockdown, just not moving, and now that was that was, that was the first time. Okay. I, know. I went running for the first time yesterday, and you know, months and months, and I spent the rest of the day being like, "I'm old and creaky." <laughs> it's so horrible, isn't it? And I, I, the only exercise I can do is to play football or you know soccer, um, because I can't do it otherwise because I get too bored. Uh, but when I'm playing soccer, it's like I'm, you know, I'm looking for the ball. I'm not thinking about the exercise I'm doing. And yeah. but the problem with that is like you really feel when you're unfit because everybody's faster than you and they're pushing you out of the way. They're stronger. And I had that last night. It was the first I played in, yeah, two years. And it wasn't nice. And then, yeah. yeah. Oh, anyway. I got, yeah, I got one last question I wanted to ask you about. And, it, mm-hmm. and I've held it off because it's a question you're asked probably all the time and you're bored of answering it. So I'm sorry. But... <laughs> How close are we to, you know, designer babies? Is that happening? And is that a concern? I think that depends on what you mean by designer babies. So I think a lot of these conversations conflate two different technologies. And one Mm. is CRISPR, which is the ability to edit the genome directly. Um, And I think that is still squarely in the realm of science fiction, Um, especially when we're talking about, um, I mean, there was a Chinese kind of rogue Chinese scientist that used CRISPR for embryos, uh, I guess last, last year. I don't even know what year it is anymore. Um, it's unclear whether or not he was successful even with that one gene. And it, um, it is illegal to do that here. Um, you know, and when we're talking about anything like, you know, forget intelligence or personality, just, you know, thinking about very physical characteristics like height or body weight, we're talking about, so many genes that the, you know, the technology to do that is really, um, you know, that that's not where we are. Um, the second is um, screening embryos that are used for IVF for polygenic spores. I think in terms of our ability to do that, we can. Um, I think it rapidly runs into the problem that we talked about earlier, which is that there aren't really good genes and bad genes for most of the things we're talking about. So are you trying to design a baby to have the lowest risk of schizophrenia or to go furthest in school? Because those two things <laughs> are opposite, you know, like what, what, yeah. um, what are we talking about there? And then of course there's the incredibly thorny questions about how to balance, um, a couple's own rights to make their own reproductive choices around the extent to which that technology, if it existed, would kind of further retrench the ideas that some traits or some people are kind of inferior or superior to others. So there's, I mean, there's just huge moral issues there and ethical issues Mm -hmm. there. um, And also just like very basic scientific problems. Yeah, I used to play this um, football manager game when I was like 15. And you you could like buy different players for your team and then the computer simulation sort of ran it. And I found a way to sort of edit the 
attributes of the players so that this guy was better at shooting and this guy was better at tackling and so on. And I sort of did that a few times and played the game. And I was loving it for the first sort of 20 minutes. I was beating everyone and then quickly found I just wanted to turn it off. I wasn't really enjoying it because there was no sense of gratification there because I had edited it beforehand. And I wonder how that mm-hmm. might feel. Would you be as proud as a parent in your son graduating from college if it's like, well, I did program him to do that? Um, You know, I don't really know how to answer that question. When I think about my own experiences as a parent, I think becoming a parent is one of the riskiest and most optimistic things you can do in this life. You have so little control about how it's going to go and what's going to happen. And at the same time, after you have a child, it feels, even though I know statistically and scientifically that, you know, my kids are just two draws from a pool of 70 trillion possible combinations. I can't imagine having another child or wanting another child. I want that child because the relationship is, so individual um you know i with your partner for instance or with other people you love in your life it's not about how do i engineer this for this aspect of you know these attributes it's about um you know here is the sum total of someone's radical individuality and as a mother i think it's falling in love with that uh, more than yeah. anything else, more than any of their like totting up some ledger of their good traits and bad traits. That's not how I feel about my kids. It's, it's it's partly the randomness that you that you love. It's just what they are. But then you'd fall. There'd be this problem, and I, I, as you're saying, it's not even a near future kind of thing. But there'd be this problem where because everyone else is doing it, it's like you don't want to lie on your CV. But if everybody else does and you don't, so you you know you'd be you'd have to because everyone and I wouldn't want to have to do that, but someone would, wouldn't they? I you know I, it's so interesting to me. I think a lot of my per- personal perspective on this is really colored by living in the U.S. and living in Texas, which is a very conservative state with regards to reproductive rights. And so, yes. um, you know, the conversations about are we going to have designer babies? Is everyone going to be pressured to do that? When I live in a state in which we, you know, the state just banned abortion at six weeks, right? So when I was pregnant with my child, my OB-GYN brought up the, the, the subject of genetic testing with great delicacy, lest I be offended at the idea of doing it. So I think so many of these conversations about what parents are inevitably going to do feel really out of sync with, um, I think, the most pressing, at least in my life, uh, issues around uh, women's reproductive lives, which is like, I, you know, we're at like, can you get basic prenatal care? Um, uh do you, do you know that you're pregnant by the time that abortion is banned in the state of Texas? It, it, it feels, I don't know. It kind of feels like the wrong conversation to be having right now. It's too far ahead and yeah, more basic rights to consider right now. Um, yeah, yeah, I was very sad about, um, what's going on there and, uh, I am too. I mean, we have the highest, one of the highest maternal mortality rates, particularly amongst women of color Hmm. in the entire developed world. Um, you know, we have one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the world. Um, and, uh, we, you know, I think there's, there's been a wrap, there's been a, an increasing reproductive health crisis in Texas. And this most recent ban, I think is just going to make it worse. Thank you for uh, this brilliant interview. And I'll, I'll, put, I'll put loads of stuff stuff in the intro. And also, I didn't just stop talking there because I disagree with you or anything. I think I, I do. I thought it was quite a powerful place. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like I'm like, thank you for that. God, get out of here. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hands up who learned something today. Okay, there's always one smart Alec who knew it all already. Well, Alec, I hope you were at least entertained by the absolute science bants. It was a pleasure talking to Dr. Catherine Page Harden, writer of The Genetic Lottery, a link to which you'll find in my show notes. But you can get it in all the normal places. Even an idiot like me 
enjoyed and understood it. So I'd recommend it if you want to get a firmer grasp on what makes you, you. And what makes you, your mum and what and your dad and your grandparents and so on. It was a pleasure having Paige on and you can hear our bonus chat on patreon.com slash andrewgold or by signing up on Apple VIP area. Do check out my sponsor, Issue, as that helps me big time and they're great. And that's issue.com slash podcast with the promo code EDGE. Remember also to follow Paige and myself on our social media channels to keep up with us and all our projects. The links are in the show notes. That's all for this week. I've been editing this a few weeks in advance while I move from place to place, so I still don't have new reviews or patrons to read out as yet. All I can do is thank you for continuing to support me either through Patreon, Apple, YouTube, or simply by just listening and sharing this podcast with friends. The bigger it grows, the closer I get to being able to do this for a living. And I owe you listeners a great deal for your support. Next up is Colin Stewart. We're going to learn about some of the weird and scary things about time and space time and space and all that stuff. Colin really makes it easy to understand for people like me. Uh, Very accessible and easy and fascinating. So I'll see you next week.